I turn that so I know I'm gonna pull it. I think we'll get dispersed. Nice morning walk. Wow. Yeah. All right. It's going to be that right there. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's coming. It is. We have a good one. Try to stay dry.
Second time's a charm. Woo! Backpacking. Hey, my name is Wes. Originally, I had not planned to ever talk to the camera like this on this channel. Uh, after this most recent hike, though, there's some stuff that I felt like I needed to talk about. Um, I consider myself to be a pretty experienced backpacker. I've done hundreds of miles in the Smokies and in the region. Um, I've been in all kinds of conditions, you know, rain, snow, sleet, you know, really hot weather, really humid weather, um, d done a lot, seen a lot, but things can go wrong, even if you're experienced and if you're prepared. So I just wanted to talk about the ending of this video, why it ended the way that it did, and, um, maybe provide some experiences that you can take away uh, into your own adventures that maybe make you more comfortable or safer uh, in your in your tracks out there. So let's get into it. Um, okay, so this last clip that you probably just saw was me filming my friend Migel crossing this creek. Um, just to give you some context, this was the third day of a three-day trip. We had on this last day uh, to cross Eagle Creek, which is the creek that you saw, uh, I think 
somewhere in the 10 to 15 time range. So basically we were going back and forth, back and forth over this creek all day. When we originally planned this trail, we knew that the third day was going to be full of creek crossings for the first half of that 10 or so miles that we had to do on that trail. We knew that was a thing. We've done that before. Um, really, you just take your time on those things usually, and it's not a problem. The other thing that we knew was that there was a chance of rain in the forecast. And when we left on Friday morning uh, at 5 a.m., um, we checked the weather and Saturday there was a chance of rain in the afternoon that we saw and on Sunday there was another chance of rain uh, starting around 12 o'clock or so uh, in the afternoon in the Smokies. So our strategy was going to be basically every day we were there, wake up early, hike through the night in the morning hours, right? And get as much time on the trail as we could before the rain started to make it through. So. Um, we did that on Saturday, which you saw us hanging out on, at camp for a while. And we'd made it there before, basically before the rain came, it rained on us a little bit, but it was fine. Uh, and our strategy was to do the same thing on, on, on Sunday for the last day. So we were going to try to get through these first five or six miles of just Creek crossings, and then we would be home free, right? So that's more or less what had happened. We, we made it through, uh, call it like all the way up until the last three or four crossings that we had to do, no problem. Every time we crossed this creek, it kept getting deeper and deeper and wider and wider because we had started at the headwaters and we were heading down to uh, basically where this creek turned into a river, which then turned into a lake, right? So the further we got down the creek, the, the bigger it got, right? So um, pretty much up until this point, um, I wasn't really filming. It was pouring down rain. I didn't have this camera out. I had my GoPro, um, which I kind of forgot that I had in the first place, but I had it out and I was filming some of the stuff. So we were crossing this creek, no problem, uh, single file, just not as a group or anything like that. We'd get across, we'd do the next one, no problem. Um, we actually made it to um, this creek crossing, probably it was honestly like 10, 9, 30, 10 o'clock, something like that, no problem. Got across everything up to then without issue. So in this particular situation, the clip you just saw was Migel's second attempt at crossing this creek. The first attempt, I was I was in front. Uh, our friend Chase was kind of behind me, and we were you know crossing in the same direction. And Migel had chosen a kind of different route. He was kind of uh, a little downstream from uh, from us, trying to go away that maybe looked a little less uh, dangerous. So I'm probably two thirds of the way across this creek, and I just lean over my shoulder, look, look over this way to see where Migel's at, because that's something you do. You keep your your spatial awareness up, right? You, you're aware of what's happening around you. And I turned around just in time to see Migel lose his footing. And Migel, at this point, uh, had been crossing these creeks in flip-flops, which was a bad idea. Uh, he was unprepared for this creek, in my opinion, um, but he was doing okay. So he lost his footing uh, he, he, in a matter of moments, was swept down this creek super quickly. Just boom, like that. He was way, way the heck down there. Luckily for him, he was really close to the creek bank. He was able to float on his pack, on his back, and grab a branch, a rhododendron, and able to stop himself and able to get himself stood up. He lost his shoes. Uh, he had brought a paper map. That map was gone. He almost lost his trekking poles. Uh, they were they were almost gone too. So he was luckily lucky to get basically out of that creek without any injuries. He he got back up on the creek bank, kind of collected himself, um, made his way back to the original part of the creek crossing, and had to put his waterproof hiking boots on and cross the creek. So that's the video you just saw of him crossing that creek, kind of struggling his way across. From there, I stopped filming because we realized that the situation was more serious than, you know, just us having a good time backpacking. At this point, Migel could have gotten hurt, uh, right? He could have hit his head on a rock the second he slipped. Um, anything could have happened. He could have broken a leg, twisted an ankle, hurt his knees, saw anything, right? So we were like, okay, this needs to be a little more serious. There's not really time for us to like film. So every creek crossing we did after that, we did it as a group. Basically, we held on to each other's packs and just kind of went really slowly. For the first, I think we did one creek like that and it was no problem. It was 
you know, a little bit tricky in one spot, but we got out of there, no, no issues. Uh, so we hiked a little further and we came up on our second to last crossing. So we had this crossing and one more, and then basically five miles to the car. So it was like 1030 at this point. And we were going to get to the car by noon. We were happy as going to, you know, get to the car by noon, dry off when we get there, be home by 435, you know, great timing, perfect, perfect way to end up an adventure like this, you know? So, uh, of course it didn't go like that, right? So what happened was we, we got to this Creek and it was not nearly as wide as it had been before. So that water has to go somewhere. If it's not going to be wide, it's, it's going to be deep, right? That's generally how that works. All of us are still on this like, okay, we're almost out of here mentality. Just two more crossings to go. We'll get through this slowly, but you know, as quick as we can while being careful. And then that'll be that. So we step off into the Creek and as soon as we step into the Creek, it was above my knee. And to give you a frame of reference, the other crossings we had done, you would step into the Creek and it maybe would be ankle deep or calf deep, right? not really up to your knees. Maybe at the deepest part of the creek, it would start to get over your knees and, and get up to your waist, right? So the fact that we stepped into this creek and it was already up to our knees was a pretty good indication that this was going to be a deeper creek than what we'd been crossing. So nonetheless, we got in there as a group. We employed the same strategy we had just employed before. We were all facing upstream, shuffling side to side, kind of like crab walking across, using our trekking poles to you know, look for rocks or look for deeper holes in the water. And this water, every step we took, just kept inching up and up uh, on our on our bodies. And eventually it got up to my chest. And I've never been in water that deep that was surging that hard. It actually was compressing my rib cage to the point where my lungs couldn't expand to get a breath. And so your body's natural reaction there is to go into fight or flight mode. And luckily I was able to kind of realize what was happening and keep myself from freaking out and uh, kind of collected myself and said, all right, guys, we need to go back. We can't go this way. We have to go back to shore. So at this point, uh, I tried to shuffle over a little bit to, to the left to go back uh, to the creek bank, but that wasn't working. So for some silly reason, I, I kind of turned. And the second I turned, the river swept me off my feet. And if my friends hadn't been holding on to me and holding on to each other, I for sure would have been swept down the creek just like Michael had been, you know, like an hour before, basically. Uh, I was in the middle of the creek too, so it would have been worse. I wouldn't have been able to grab on branches or anything like that. I probably would have had to ditch my pack, which had this camera in it and my, my photo camera and all of the gear that I've collected over the years to like, you know, build out my backpacking setup. It would have been, it would have been gone. That would have been, in my opinion, the best case scenario. Worst case scenario, I would have ditched the pack and then got hurt or worse after. Um, so eventually they were able to grab me, hold on to me. I got my footing underneath me and I made my way back to the Creek. And at this point we were all kind of like reevaluating our circumstances because even though we had this Creek and one more to go, suddenly it felt like we were stuck, you know, a hundred miles in the middle of nowhere. Like we were, we were trapped. It kind of felt like, but yet we were still close enough to where we felt like we could maybe, maybe get out. So at this point, we looked at our map. We were like, okay, where are we? How far away from, you know, the end of this trail are we? Just getting our bearings, right? So this particular part of the, the creek was a horseshoe bend. We were on, you know, kind of one side of this horseshoe bend. We were going to cross here. This creek was gonna go up and around. And we would walk across a little bit of land and cross again. So basically we would be on the same side of the creek that we were already on uh, this, these crossings were just cutting out a good leg of that kind of horseshoe bend. Probably against our better judgment, we tried to actually bushwhack around the edge of this horseshoe bend. So what that actually meant in practice was this horseshoe bend, uh, the mountain beside it was extremely steep. It was, it was very, very, very steep. So we were literally climbing up the side of this mountain and, uh, on our hands and knees up this hill in the rain, in the mud, through rhododendron tunnels, through the brushiest brush you could imagine with briars and down trees and, you know, all of that stuff everywhere, trying to make our way up and around this creek. There were a couple of times where we were trying to kind of traverse across just giant rocks just under the ground. They were just loosely covered with leaves and moss and it was all soaking wet. So a very dangerous situation, probably riskier than what we should have been trying to do to get out of there. 
Uh, so eventually we decided to come off of the hill and go down to the horseshoe bend of this creek and we were going to just traverse around the edge of the water. Well, we hit a spot where we couldn't go any further. There was just this gigantic slab of rock that rose from under the river up to the side of the cliff. Just, I mean, a huge, huge rock. We couldn't tell how far that rock was going into the water. Maybe it was five or 10 feet straight down. We, we don't know. Uh, we couldn't cross it because it was just slick, wet rock beside a raging river. So we cut our losses. We doubled back. We hiked in the water all upstream back to the original creek crossing we had just tried and we collected ourselves. From here on, we were very serious about the situation. There was, like I said, no filming taking place because our safety was the number one priority. Filming things wasn't exactly where our heads were at uh, at that moment. So at this point, um, we started talking about our options. And my friend, Migel, he had recently purchased a satellite phone. And this satellite phone, I actually have one here because I bought it now. Um, basically the way it works is you pair your phone to this device and then through this thing, you can send uh, text messages to basically anyone you want. And Migel uh, was able to send a message to his wife, let her know, hey, we're not hurt, but we're stuck in a situation that's inconvenient. Uh, we're kind of kind of trapped here. We didn't get a message back from her for a while. We wasn't we weren't sure if his device worked at all, if she had received the message or or not. So. We started discussing a plan B. This particular device, it's the same one that he has, has an SOS button on the side of it. We hadn't read the manual. We didn't know what was gonna happen if you press that button. Basically, we're having a conversation around all the ifs, right? Like what happens if we press that and then, you know, they send a helicopter or something ridiculous out here for us. You know, we're not hurt. We don't need all that, We, but we don't know if we're gonna be able to communicate with whoever is coming to save us, right? Uh, also, we had no idea if there would be a cost associated, associated with this. Would this cost us hundreds of dollars, thousands, tens of thousands of dollars if they brought something like that out? Um, you know, if they don't bring a helicopter, are they just bringing a search team? Like, is it going to be people coming in on horseback or ATVs or, uh, or what's going to happen, right? We had no idea. We had no context for what was going to, what's going to happen when we press this button. Eventually though, we decided, you know what? we're going to press it. Worst that can happen is they bring something ridiculous out like that. And then we have to pay a lot of money or, or something like that. Um, of course, naturally we press the button and like probably five minutes later, we get word back from Migel's wife. Uh, she had contacted the ranger station at the great, Sm great smoky mountains national park and notified them of our situation and our location because we had sent her our GPS coordinates. They in turn gave her the dispatcher number for the ranger dispatcher station uh, out in that region of the Smokies. And she gave us that information and they had asked us to contact them to, you know, start talking about what our options were. At this point, we heard back from the SOS button on the, on the device basically, and it had done the same thing. It reached out to a company that uh, I guess monitors the line that these things reach out on. It contacted the Rangers as well. Everyone knew where we were at this point. There was no question about it. After we started talking to the dispatcher, uh, they informed us that it was not likely that anyone was going to come for us that day. They asked us to either try to go back the way we came, if it was safe to do so, and didn't involve crossing any more creeks, which of course it did. You know, We would have had to go back up 10 or 15 creeks and 25 miles to get back out of there, basically reversed the way that we came. It was not an option. Uh, so we, they told us to sit tight. They said, hey, no one's coming for you tonight. Just wait it out, wait for the water to, to fall and, and you'll get out of there tomorrow or, or the next day. So we did that. At this point, uh, this was a three day trip reminder. We had, I had brought two main meals and a lot of snacks, uh, not three meals because we were gonna be out of there on the third day, right? And I, I usually just have like a couple of you know, energy bars or, or something like that for breakfast. I don't really eat a lot. So I didn't have a ton of food. The other guys were running low on their food as well, but we made it work. Our gear was soaking wet because it had been pouring down rain all day. Uh, and we had crossed these creeks multiple times. Migel went for a swim, right? So we were all kind of just like, well, that sucks. Everything's wet. My sleeping bag was soaking wet um, and all of that. Luckily for us, we got the shelter up really quickly. We were able to put our gear underneath the shelter and eventually started drying stuff out, which was okay. The rain had stopped 
and you know we made a little camp there right by the river on the trail you know just five miles from the car you know like i said we would have been out of there at 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 noon or one o'clock at the latest and been home four or five you know but in this situation we weren't going to make it we had to sit there uh our significant others notified uh the place where we work and told them that we weren't going to be coming in on monday um they were concerned but you know to our relief they were okay with that like we weren't going to get in any kind of trouble or anything like that which we were really thankful for um and we just sat tight the next day we woke up uh, it was like 9.30 or 10 we slept in because there was no point in waking up early. And the clouds had gone. It was blue skies. Really cold still. It was probably like in the high 40s. A little bit chilly. Uh, but most of our gear had dried out. So at this point, um, the rangers were still kind of telling us the same thing. Like, hey, no one's really coming to get you. Wait for the water to drop and try to cross if it's safe. And so that was going to be our first plan, right? We were going to stay there. Uh, until, you know, 1230, something like that, maybe give it a shot and, and try to make it across. In the meantime, I was looking at the topographic maps uh, on the app that I use to, to kind of track our trails, and I found us another route that if we had to, we could make it out of there. It would have taken, I don't know, three, four, maybe five hours for us to do it. Uh, it would have been risky because we would have been going into kind of the back country of the Smokies off trail, which is generally not advised. Uh, in any situation, but it would have got us out of there for sure. But we weren't sure if the Rangers were going to be okay with that. So we sent them, you know, kind of the rough plan of what we were thinking as our plan B. We were really looking for them to say, no, don't, don't do that. Don't attempt it. It's too risky, too dangerous, yada, yada. Uh, they didn't say that though. <laughs> they were basically like, uh, we don't know the skill level of the group that you're with or the conditions of your group. So they were understandably kind of deferring to us to say, if you think it's something you're capable of, give it a shot. Otherwise, don't, right? They weren't coming out and saying, no, don't do it, though. Our strategy really didn't change. We were still going to cross the creek if we could. If we couldn't, we would backtrack and try to go, you know, around this way longer around this horseshoe bend to meet up with the trail again. That was basically going to be our, our plan. So we tore down camp, we got everything ready to go, packed our bags. I had put back on my, my water crossing shoes, my Chacos, which is what I used for that. And uh, we were getting ready to go. And then of course, as soon as we start to put the plane in motion, we get a message back on, on the device. And it says, hey, there are two rangers coming to get you. Sit tight, don't move, they'll be there soon. So we had a lot of questions about what that actually meant. Uh, we didn't know if they were gonna bring you know, horses or ATVs or, or a boat or something like that to like get us across this creek. We were just really curious about what that would look like. And also, like I said, we were still two and a half hours away from the trailhead, the nearest trailhead. So we were figuring it was one o'clock or something like that. They'd probably get there at two or three and then we'd still have to hike out another two and a half hours. So it'd be like six or seven, maybe something like that by the time we got out of there. But that was going to be a lot better than have to spend another night there. So we're like, okay, cool. No worries. We'll sit there. Well, turns out they showed up like 35, 40 minutes later uh, and come to find out they had taken a boat across Fontana Lake up the river as far as they could and hiked in that way. So they show up, you know, they yell across the river like, how are you guys feeling? Is everyone okay? All that good stuff that they should do as rangers. They did a great job with it. Uh, and they told us to sit tight. They were going to go up the creek and try to find another crossing if they could. They would be more you know, safer for us to do. Of course, they came back 10 or 15 minutes later and they were like, there are no other crossings. Uh, we're gonna have to go with your your plan B. My hope was that they were gonna go the long way, the, the safer way around, not the way that we had tried the previous day, you know, up the really steep cliff and, and all of that. Uh, but of course they came that way, which was okay. Uh, they, they had a backpack on. It wasn't like, you know, hours with, filled with like backpacking gear, but like emergency rations and, and all that stuff. They showed up uh, probably took them 45 minutes, I would say, to get across all the way around. And they were drenched in sweat and it was going to be a rough hike. But, you know, we followed them out of there. It took us about an hour to, to actually make it back to the, you know, the, basically the other part of the horseshoe where that trail, you know, showed up again. And um, there were times when we were hiking with them where they were very candid about the danger of the area that we were in. We hiked like, I don't know, 
two or 300 feet straight up the side of this cliff with them. Um, and there were parts where instead of just being a single incline, uh, it was a super steep incline. And then there was actually just a cliff, a sheer cliff. So we would be like up on this part of the, you know, the, the side of the mountain. And if you slipped, you know, there's a cliff right here and you just could kill yourself or, or you know, seriously injure yourself at best. Um, and they're like, hey, look, try not to fall. Be very sure-footed. If you, if you do fall, spread out. Try to grab something as quick as you can. Do whatever you can to stop yourself because if you do, it's going to be a really bad situation. So we encountered that multiple times where it was just like very precarious, really dangerous. And uh, luckily we got out of there fine for the most part. Uh, a couple scratches here and there because we were bushwhacking through, you know, the back country of the Smokies. Um, but we made it. And uh, we were able to hitch a ride with them on their patrol boat that they took across the lake, which was uh, a relief because none of us felt like hiking another five miles to the car. They didn't have to do that, so we were super grateful for it. But basically, they took us to the marina. I left my, my backpack with my and chase at the marina. I got them to let me ride in their squad car back to the trailhead. Uh, so I was able to drive back to the marina and pick up my friends. And then from there, we were basically on our way home. And, you know, it went from us, like, being trapped out there maybe another day to being home that day. And uh, we got home at, like, midnight or 1 o'clock or something like that after it was all said and done uh, on Monday. But we were glad to be home either way. So um, I just wanted to say that even if you're an experienced backpacker or hiker, uh, things can turn for the worst, even even if you don't expect it, or even if you do expect it, right? Things can go wrong. Uh, so things that I would say for you, if you're looking at this video and maybe you're looking for, uh, you know, tips or tricks, I guess, on like how to survive out there. Number one, I would say stay calm. We never once got upset with each other or frustrated with each other or, you know, or anything like that. Uh, we knew we were in a stressful situation and we all just kept it as light as we could and we kept making jokes uh, and cutting up like a bunch of, bunch of guys do to keep the mood light. So that was probably the most important thing I would say that we could have done because if we had freaked out and started panicking, we could have definitely got ourselves into trouble. Uh, the next thing I'd say, say is, you know, have something like this with you. It doesn't have to be this one, but have something like this with you. We've done dozens and dozens of trips in the Smokies, like I said. Uh, this was the first time we ever had one of these in our group. And if we hadn't have had that, people would have probably thought the worst. We were supposed to have been home at a certain point, And if we didn't show up or start calling people, they definitely would have been worried. But more importantly, they would have had no idea where we were at. They knew what trail we were on, but like... Who knows, right, where we could have gotten off trail or something like that. Without something like this, we had no way to let them know. So have something like this. Make the investment. I literally bought this one as soon as I got back. I'm going to have it with me. I hope I never have to use it again. I don't plan on having to use it again. But it might save your life or save your family a lot of heartache. So do that. Thirdly, bring food. Bring lots of food. Bring extra food. I always cut it close with how much food I bring because I'm always planning for a good situation. From now on, I'm going to have every meal covered. So if it's a three-day trip, I'll still bring two meals and all the snacks I bring. But I plan on bringing emergency meals. So I plan on bringing something like instant mashed potatoes or instant rice or something like that that just gives me calories to give me that extra sustenance. It doesn't weigh a lot, but it gives me something to eat on. Maybe not a full backpacking meal like I normally would bring, but something that's gonna give me energy because it was not a great time uh, having to just like have snacks for basically two days straight and not a single meal. So bring a lot of food, definitely do that. Other than that, I would say, make sure you're checking the weather patterns very carefully. We did that in our situation. It didn't really help uh, because the weather changed. But I think that that's something that I'm going to consider more strongly in the future is if we're looking at a trail and there's a lot of creek crossings and there's even a chance of rain, I think we're going to pick a different trail next time because I've been on trips where there's a chance of rain and it doesn't rain and it works out. 
But after going through what we just went through, it feels too much like rolling the dice and leaving it to fate. And I like to plan things out and know exactly what we're getting into and how we're going to get out of there. So that's, um, you know, kind of the plan that we're going to go with going forward. If there's rain, we just won't go through creek crossings because, you know, we've done them before and we'll do them again. But there's no sense in putting ourselves into that situation in the future. Uh, and I guess the last thing I would say is make sure that your friends and family know where you're going. Uh, that's something that I always do. I I let, you know, my significant other know like where we're going, what area of the Smokies we're going to be in, if we're going there, what our trails are. I try to give her an update on, you know, we'll be out of the woods at this point. So if you don't hear from me, yada, yada, I know what to do. Here's the plan, that sort of thing, right? I let my parents know, I let my sister know. I try to be over communicative with people about this stuff. So make sure you're, you're telling people where you're at uh, because the last thing you want is to get hurt somewhere and no one know about it, right? So that's, that's, um, that's really important. All of this is to say, even if you're experienced, even if you have all the gear with you to do the right things, you can still up in a situation where things are not in your favor. Be safe out there, be prepared, and take it seriously, but have a good time with it, and don't let yourself panic if you get into one of these situations. I don't know that I'm gonna do another one of these, you know, just talking to the camera segments again. Um, I might in the future if there's something like this that I wanna talk about, uh, but I feel like this was important enough to where I kind of diverge from the normal content style uh, on this channel to, to let people know things can happen and, and you need to be prepared. The last thing I wanted to say was just a huge, huge thank you to the two park rangers who helped us get out of that situation. Uh, I thank them many, many times in person, but if they happen to come across this video, uh, I just would like to say thank you again for, for helping us. Uh, you all put your lives at risk to help us get to safety and um, I don't think I'll ever forget that. So thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Thank you for watching this. I hope that you got some information out of this that would be useful for you uh, or your friends in the future. So thanks for watching this. Be safe out there and have fun.